to talk to y'all about digital radiographic image processing and manipulation. And I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to talk about something that really I have zero clue about, but I think that y'all know a little bit about. I've watched maybe four or five of these videos and a few reaction videos about people putting makeup on. Um, that's like a thing, right? Y'all know this. Um, and so that's about all I know about applying makeup, but I assume that many of us in this classroom know a little bit about applying makeup, that there's good and not so good ways of doing it. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we're gonna use as a metaphor for talking about these pictures. So hopefully it'll, it'll help some of us. If you, if you feel like you're lost in the dark about this stuff, um, I'm gonna try to use that as a metaphor to kind of guide us through this material. So here's the objectives I've got. Um, I want to talk about image histograms and what they are. Um, talk about automatic rescaling. Uh, we'll talk about image latitude and, and uh, as with digital as compared with film. And so you may remember about this time last year when we were in the image production lab, we did a lab called the effects of, ex of KVP on exposure latitude, right? And if you don't remember, that's fine. But what the lab looked like was we, we just took hand x-rays. You took three hand x-rays, right? And all you changed was the KVP. You changed it according to the 15% rule, right? So you raised the you raised the KVP while doing what to the mass? You dropped the mass down. So the first exposure was like 45 KVP at like 25 mass, right? And then you stepped it up to 75 KVP at 5 mass. And then you stepped it up again to 100 kVp at like 2.5 mass, right? So you were following the 15% rule as you were increasing the kVp and decreasing the mass. So the exposure indicator said what? Same. The same thing, right? Because you were following the 15% rule. But the pictures looked remarkably different, right? So we're going to be talking about that today. I just wanted to remind you of that lab because we're going to be looking at that again. And I am always reminded, I've, I've been in this now weeks long YouTube conversation with a teacher, I think in California, trying to make sure students understand the contrast piece. And I know that it's something that it's deep, right? And so I want to make sure that y'all understand how grounded we are in this material, how much, how much we, we've been talking about this. Um, so contrast enhancement parameters, what the computer does to influence contrast. Um, and so you can think about, uh, like, for example, with this eye, right, the way that they've done the makeup on this eye, it is enhancing the contrast of uh, the lid of the eye, right, as well as the, the, the bone just above the eye, right? Um, and so that's the type of stuff that we need to start to understand how to look at and appreciate as x-ray text, because that's the kind of diagnostic detail we're looking for. We'll talk about the Nyquist theorem, which we've alluded to a little bit, and largely we need to understand it because it has to do with signal sampling and what happens if a, if a signal's not sampled appropriately, right? Um, and it's also one of the reasons why if I was doing a YouTube video, I would never wear this shirt, right? So we'll talk about why that's the case here in just a little bit. Um, we'll talk about improper algorithm application, uh, manipulation stuff that we do on the back end, and then how we manage the images. The management piece is probably the easiest of the all it's, of them all. It's probably what I'll spend the least amount of time on. This is again chapter three in our textbook, Digital Radiography Impacts by uh, Christy Carter and Beth Veal. So um, before we start talking about how the computer is going to mess with this stuff, we just need to think about image sampling. So both the PSP and these flat panel detector systems um, have to convert X-rays into electric signals, right? And that's what sampling is. Um, these signals are what we're going to use for processing and for, for manipulation. So this is what has to be digitized in essence, right? So it's going to first be an analog signal, electric signal, and then it's going to be digitized by the ADC. Pre-processing. So we're, we're talking about processing and manipulation. So underneath that umbrella of processing, there's two things. There's what the computer does and there's what technologists and doctors do, right? If the computer does it, that's pre-processing, right? If the technologist or the doctor is doing it, we call that post-processing, right? For the most part, you want to avoid post-processing, right? You want to have enough knowledge of how to affect things when you're positioning the patient to avoid any post-processing. 
if there's consistently, if there's post-processing going on in the department, something's wrong in some area of workflow. So if technologists, for example, are consistently putting digital left markers on, post-processing, something's wrong in that department. Like, why the heck does no one own a lead left marker, right? So the first thing that the computer does is analyze that signal, right? And it uses uh, special programs to do that. And it's similar to these types of maps that people place on their faces prior to doing makeup, right? They're analyzing what is the area we're going to apply the makeup to, right? They have to figure out where the face ends and where the face begins, what are the high points of the face, the low points of the face, and everything in between, right? So in a similar way, the computer has to figure out where's the collimated edges of the exposed field, right? Um, what scatter? What is just that wall of noise outside of the patient's anatomy? That black area, right? Where it looks just like the patient's floating in outer space, right? It doesn't need that information, right? There's information out in that black area. Have you ever thought about that? There's all sorts of information out in that black area. But the computer rec recognizes, I don't need that information. I need diagnostic information, the stuff that's not out in that black area. Um, and each and every vendor has their own way of doing this, right? So stuff that Errors that happen in histogram formation on the Fuji system are totally different than the Siemens system. The same type of error might look different too, right? So something to bear in mind. Just like different people, when they look at the human face, notice different details about it. I spent some time this weekend. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a bad drawer. I can draw pretty well. And I was drawing pictures of my, my children's faces, right? Um, and it was really fun. Um, and you, it really makes you realize, uh, you know, all the details that are there in the face. Um, so uh, anytime the computer cannot find the area that the image where the diagnostic information begins or ends, the resulting image will be too bright or too dark. You can. I guarantee you there will probably be a registry question about that. That if it, if it wasn't able to figure out where the histogram was, what happened, right? And the answer is it's either going to be too bright or too dark. That is the whole answer, right? Um, there's no reason to like piecemeal and try to guess, oh, it's going to be too bright or it's going to be too dark, right? Because it pretty much would need to be both. Every single one of these systems mismanages information differently, right? Um, one of the things that you can do, right, very simple, is to center appropriately, right? So again, how do we avoid this histogram error? Know where to center for your images, right? We can probably think of times when we've miscentered for like a hip. That's a pretty easy one sometimes to miscenter on, like post-op hip or, or hip on a, on a relatively large patient, right? Easy to miscenter on and the kinds of, oh, I may need to window this a little bit, right? Um, types of things that happen when we miss center, right? Um, some of that has to do with the machine not finding exactly what it expected, right, from what we gave it. This is what a histogram looks like, right? It's a graphical representation of the exposure values that the image receptor received. And it's a little weird to look at. Like, I can't look at that and say, oh, that looks like a chest x-ray. But the computer does. It looks at that and it says, oh, that looks like a chest x-ray, right? So what is it looking at? Well, the horizontal axis is the tone values, right? Um, and it's the number of, uh, and it's counting at each level different tone values. So, um, and, and different systems look at this differently. But generally, one extreme end of this histogram is going to be black, and the other extreme end, like for example, uh, maybe the right side would be white, right? Now, I do believe different systems do this differently, right? Um, for the most part, uh, I believe with, with the CT imaging systems, the uh, white is on the left and the black is on the right, if I remember correctly. 
You don't necessarily need to know that though. What you need to know is that across this continuum here, it's moving from white to black or from black to white. So everything in the middle must be what? Gray. Gray. And all these peaks and valleys that we're seeing on this is counts of pixels that have that gray value. So it doesn't care where the pixel was at in the picture. It just knows that, oh, this many pixels had this gray value, gray value A. Now, gray value B had 37 pixels. Gray value C had 15 pixels. It's just counting the pixels that have that specific digitized value. So as the IR is scanned, um, it figures out the image location and orientation. It determines what's the size or the amplitude of the signal, right? And then it starts placing a value on every single pixel, right? One of the most significant things you can understand about this goes back to that white versus black thing, right? It has to figure out what is the minimum, the S1, and the maximum S2 signals within that anatomic range, right? What is the minimum and the maximum? Because that essentially tells it this is where the diagnostic information is. It's between the minimum and the max. Everything beyond the minimum and the max, not helpful. Right? If it's less than the minimum, not helpful. If it's greater than the max, not helpful. Right? And one thing that I should point out is the graphic representation. That histogram looks different for every single piece of anatomy. So a chest looks different from a hand, looks different from a knee. Doesn't look much different to me, but it looks very different to the computer. So you may have recalled in the past I've said you didn't know that you were becoming statisticians when you became x-ray techs, but this is the statistical side of your job, right? So in this case, on this histogram here, we have areas of low attenuation, right? The lungs and then areas of high attenuation. So on this histogram, which side of the histogram is going to appear black? The left side, the left side and which side is going to appear white? The right. Okay, so if you remember white on the right, right, um, for most histograms that is the case, right? Um, uh, yeah, and I'll leave any further discussion of that to the academic people. But we have this little dip in the middle, and this is unique to this particular chest x-ray shot on this particular system. Now one of the weird things that I'm just going to have to take on faith, I tried to double check this. Um, in the textbook, I tried to research this and figure out, is this really true? Because this seems counterintuitive to me and I don't know why it would be the case, but our textbook states that low energy KVP gives a wider histogram. I am gonna test you on that statement, right? I'm saying that with at the same time, like I've not read that anywhere else, right? So I cannot yet verify that, but I'm working with that right now. Because that's the type of stuff that I think we need to know is x-ray text, that if I'm using a low KVP, I'd get a wider histogram. If I use a high energy KVP, it would give me a narrower histogram. I don't really understand how that could be the case. Yeah. So the, the question was, does lowering the KVP, so lowering the KVP causes more photons to be attenuated inside the patient, and so lowering the KVP should enhance or improve image contrast. That is true. Right? That's why I can't wrap my mind around this statement. So there must be something the computer's doing that's different than the way that I normally think about this process. So I'm just, I'm just kind of making on, on faith. Um, I will try to bike back it up at some point. Continue to think about things the way that you're thinking about them, though. Right? Um, Yeah, low, that, uh, in essence, a low KVP, right, should give you what kind of contrast? Okay, so we, we will get back into the lab and make sure that we're grounded on that, that this high KVP is what's going to give us a low contrast, right? And conversely, a low KVP is what will give us a higher contrast, higher subject contrast, right? Um, that's why I cannot quite understand this statement here from our textbook. So I, will, I want to see some research that backs this statement up.
No, 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 no. I need, I need to review the literature, is what I'm saying. But for the purposes of the exam, just know this is what our textbook states, that a low energy KVP gives a wider histogram, a high energy KVP gives a narrow histogram. Okay, so what can go wrong, right? It's complicated stuff. It's the first thing we need to understand, right? Um, that's my friend. Um, <laughs> but when we have a shape that is unexpected for a piece of anatomy, right? Um, like, for example, if we told the machine that what we were shooting was a chest x-ray, but we actually gave it a knee x-ray, that's going to throw things off. So it is absolutely essential that you choose an anatomic, the correct anatomic region prior to making an exposure. I can imagine times in our workflow, right, when we've got the knee pulled up and the patient didn't show up or whatever reason, we keep that histogram up, we keep that lookup table up, and we just shoot the chest on it, right? You probably have seen that happen in clinic. That's going to cause all sorts of problems for the machine. So why? Why would it cause that type of problem, right? Well, the raw data that's used for that histogram um, is going to be compared back to a normal histogram of the same body part by the computer. It's going to say, oh, all right, here's what you gave me, here's what I expected, right? And it starts to correct based on what it was given and what it expected. Those histograms, are, those corrections are significant, right? They change everything from the image contrast, the display contrast, to density values, to all sorts of things. And it can get pretty ugly pretty quick. To really understand what's happening, right, with the sampling part and where these sampling errors can originate, we kind of need to go back a few years to like 1928 and think about sampling theorem, right? This is as theoretical as I will get today. We need to understand the Nyquist theorem and that it, it was basically um, mathematically proven, right, and it's been revised by a lot of different people. Oftentimes, we just simply call it the sampling theorem, right? So maybe called the Nyquist theorem, a.k.a. the sampling theorem. They mean the same thing. I don't know what the registry is going to call it, but it will probably ask you a question about it, right? All right. Saying this theorem as simply as possible is basically the sampling frequency, right, has to be greater than twice the bandwidth of the input, right? in order to reconstruct the image correctly. We have to sample two times as fast as we're sending, right? So imagine it, imagine it like this, right? The, maybe one way to think about it is, um, I don't know, what's one of those really, really fast rap songs? Like The Sound of Sci Science by the Beastie Boys. Really, really fast rap. I don't, I, I'm going back a few years. I know that there's more quicker raps that have come out recently, right? <laughs> Now imagine your grandfather listening to that rap, right? Yes. Can your grandfather sample at the speed of the signal that's being given to him? Oh, that's an impressive grandfather. <laughs> so Larry, Larry could, right? My grandfather could not have sampled at the speed of that song. Like I literally, they could have been saying anything, right? They could have been saying anything at that point. Every other word could be the F word and my grandfather would be like, I don't understand what I'm hearing right now, <laughs> right? So that is the Nyquist theorem, right? Um, there's a signal being sent, but the rate it's sampling at is slower than how quickly the signal is being sent. They are rapping faster than this dude can hear, right? <laughs> rapping faster than the speed of sound, I think is like kind of everyone's game. Yeah. When, when a rapper breaks the speed of sound, like literally there's gonna be this cosmic boom that goes off and all life will just stop and everything will be happy at that point, is my guess. Um, but uh, that's exactly what happens with our computers. If we're not able to sample, if we got a grandfather computer and that, that computer cannot sample at how quickly the information is being given, you're going to get errors, right? That's the Nyquist theorem. Um, so it needs to be twice the number of pixels needed to form an image, right? We need these massive matrices that have microscopic pixels in them. I can't see those micros microscopic pic pixels, mm -hmm. but um, I need two pixels to, 
in order for the human eye to still see a, a pretty picture, right? If we don't have enough pixels, we get a lack of resolution. This starts to affect our spatial resolution. Oversampling at the same time doesn't result in additional useful information. It just makes the file size bigger and bigger and bigger kind of endlessly. So we have to find some kind of uh, Goldilocks place, right, where the porridge isn't too hot, isn't too cold. We've sampled just enough to get a picture. And that is literally what they call it in computer programming is the Goldilocks moment when you've got just the right amount of sample for what you need. <clears throat> so we can imagine, though, all sorts of places where this would apply and affect things, right? The first would be anytime we're converting stuff, right? So with a indirect capture digital system, we're converting x-rays to light and then converting the light to an electric signal. We've got two chances to miss sample at that point, right? Um, conversely, with a direct capture, we're taking x-rays and we're converting them directly into electric signal. So one chance for missampling according to the Nyquist theorem, right? So the indirect method um, has a highest potential for loss of signal by what I've just told you about the Nyquist theorem. In a PSP system, there's an even greater chance, right? Uh, for us to miss sample because not only do we have this conversion problem, we also have the fact that um, after we've exposed a, a CR cassette, it starts to lose that information. The crystals start to just kind of spontaneously give off their information. So the longer a cassette sits there without being scanned by the laser, the longer time it has to lose some of its signal. Right. This is one of the reasons, again, we're moving away from computed radiography. So both of these systems, right, are still better than conventional radiography, right? Um, so we still um, can apply the Nyquist theorem in that consideration as well, right? Well, what happens when it does miss sample? And this is the answer to why I wouldn't wear this shirt, right, um, if I was doing a stand-up video or something like that. Have you ever been watching a news show or maybe an old, like, video, and someone, dude's wearing a shirt or woman's wearing a dress, and it looks like her dress is, like, coming from another dimension because there's all these weird crisscrossing lines on it? That is the Nyquist theorem in effect, right? You can Google like aliasing or moray patterns and you'll see exactly what I'm saying. A computer camera, right, would not be able to sample my shirt sufficient for the signal that it's receiving from my shirt. It would scramble the camera, right? And you'd get this weird artifact, right? Um, anytime we have sampling that's, that occurs less than twice per cycle, we lose information and we wind up with a fluctuating signal. That fluctuation is what we're calling a moray pattern. Essentially, the image gets mirrored back on itself, right? Um, so, this is one of the reasons why we need to move away from grids the deeper that we go into digital waters. The more and more digital we become, the more and more we need to consider get rid of the grid. Why? Because the grid is throwing in an interference pattern. As the grid, as the grid just, if it's, if it's a stationary grid, as it just sits there, or an oscillating grid as it oscillates, right? It's throwing in an additional signal. You may not have thought about the effects of the grid as a signal, but the computer sure does. And it sees that signal. It sees the grid signal. That's how smart these machines are, right? And it can throw it off. So grids can contribute to a more effect, even if you're using the grid right, right? So the very first thing, if you see a more pattern on your pictures, wonder if it's the grid. Did the grid do it? It's one of the reasons why people aren't using eight by one grids anymore for portable work. Pretty much everyone across the boards moved to five by one grids, right? Because they recognized this error, you know, five, 10 years ago. Um, Again, this would be, if we're going back to the metaphor with grandpa, this would be like now, 
Um, Grandpa, I want you to listen to both this song where they're rapping really, really fast and also listen to this Billy Ray Cyrus song at the same time, which is basically what Old Town Road, I guess. But um, that combined signal now has just totally thrown this system off, right? And that's what's happening when we, when we apply a grid to our x-rays, right? Um, sometimes we call this a, a critical frequency, right? If we have sampling at exactly the same rate, um, it can cause aliasing as well. All right, going back to the makeup metaphors, um, Jim Carrey, I've been on the fence about him for a long time. I, so I kind of love him or hate him. I, it's like I have years where I love him and years where I hate him. Um, yeah. Tom Hanks is the same way um, for me. I don't know. But um, I wanted to show you all this, this awful picture of him because uh, this is the reason, in essence, why we do automatic rescaling, right? Um, in reality, we all kind of look more like Jim Carrey in this picture, right? Our x-rays do too. They've got blemishes on them, right? We're not perfect. Um, automatic rescaling is accounting for all those known imperfections in, in the image, right? Um, so, it is trying to create a uniform brightness and contrast regardless of the amount of exposure received. So, if I automatically rescaled this picture of Jim Carrey, it would automatically get rid of the zits, right? Um, I guess in makeup terms, we can think about it as like foundation, right? Um, it's going to apply a foundation to our x-ray pictures and get rid of the imperfections that are known. The, it knows that's an imperfection, just get rid of it. It's not obscuring diagnose, diagnostic information. It's not obscuring anything like that. That's automatic rescaling. Can't make problems? Yes, it can, right? Where would we expect the problems to come from? If it didn't get enough exposure, so if we see graininess, or if we see an exposure indicator that, that it did, it's clear, the IR was not exposed sufficiently, there is more higher potential for automatic rescaling errors. Right. Um, you can think about this in our lab all the time. We, I think we did those types of experiments where we overexposed the IR and we underexposed the IR and all the pictures looked beautiful. That is automatic rescaling, right? Um, if it's underexposed, though, we would expect it to look grainy and eventually you start to lose diagnostic information like trabicular pattern in the bone. You may not be able to identify a fracture. <clears throat> If we overexpose it, what happens? Well, it's not as noticeable, right? Um, in fact, it might not be that bad. Um, but generally, you start to lose um, clarity of contrast in soft tissues, right? So rescaling is no substitute for appropriate technical factors, but technologists recognized this pretty early on. They realized there's no way to burn the picture out, right? I've already uh, given you all the, my stump speech about this, um, but just be aware of that, that if, if you're not looking at an exposure indicator, there's no way to tell if the image is overexposed or underexposed. If you're not looking at a deviation index, you can't tell because automatic rescaling is doing its work. Right. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay, good, good. So, great example though. So if we shoot our images, for example, like if we shoot a hand x-ray under a hip histogram, the machine will automatically rescale or it may totally scramble its signal and you're going to wind up with something that looks black, the exposure indicator is going to be thrown off, it's not, it didn't get anything that it expected at that point. So it's going to, the machine will just kind of go haywire and it'll probably just give you a black picture. So yes, there are ways we can kind of throw it off. The big takeaway though here in terms of kind of last thing to think about with automatic rescaling goes back to um, if we really want to be serious about uh, dose creep, we need some kind of standardized technique charts, right? Now a lot of times they're built into the machine, right? If you're using an automatic exposure indicator or an AEC I should say, something like a technique chart has been built into the machine. I think it's still helpful to have it posted there, printed out next to the machine so you know this is what we expect to shoot on this machine 
if you're not seeing that in your department, frankly, that's a failure of the management, right? But I've, I, I'll tell you this, I, one of the reasons I'm stressing this is, is because you probably will work at places where it's not there, right? Um, I've had techs who, if you can imagine this at a small clinic, one, the older tech leaves, new tech gets hired out of our program, right? They show up at this job site, there's no, what? There's no technique chart. I don't know what I'm shooting here. The old tech took it all with her, right? I've been on phone calls with several students and just kind of walked them through here's how you build a technique chart, right? I've literally gone out with phantoms to, tech, to shot to sites just to build a technique chart, right? Um, and that's generally what's required is, is a phantom. If you don't have a phantom, just start with a hand x-ray and just build from there, just like what we did last summer. To go back to uh, what we were talking about earlier though, part of the problem with the hand versus the hip situation goes back to the lookup table. And this is that table of expectations. It's what the machine expected is on the lookup table, right? Um, so I, I think about it like this. It's like if I invited you over for dinner and what I had was breakfast, it might throw you off a little bit, right? So if, if I've got what I've got on the table, it looks like breakfast to you and I told you you're coming over for dinner, that's kind of weird, right? So the same thing happens for the machine. It kind of throws its stomach off if you tell it, hey, um, I just shot a hip and you give it a hand, right? It's going back to what it expected to see, right? And it starts to change the luminance values or the brightness values from the signal that it got. So similar to the example that we just got, when you see luminance values, one of the things you can be thinking is, oh, it completely blacked it out, right? So if you ever shoot a picture and it completely blacks it out, think something just jacked up the luminance values, i.e. the lookup table. Like that's the first thing that I'm gonna guess is, off, right? Throwing off the lookup table would also throw off the exposure indicator because why? It's thrown off the S1 and S2 values. Like I said, we just kind of kind of nerd up on this stuff a little bit to understand what we're seeing. This lookup table is a mapping function, right? So it's going to change all the pixels to a new gray value, right? Um, so that it has the appropriate brightness and contrast for that piece of anatomy. Because you can think about it, all the brightness and contrast levels that we expect look slightly different for different pieces of anatomy. The contrast level for a hand looks different than the contrast level for a chest. And that's the type of operations it's making. This is provided for every single piece of anatomy, right? If you ever have any doubt about what it is you're shooting or what is on this image receptor, right? Like I think this was a hand, but maybe it's a L5S1 spot film, I would process it underneath a, 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 some kind of contrast QC function, right? Because it, it doesn't have any lookup table for that. It's not really expecting anything particular off of that. We can, be, we can think about how these things are graphed. I don't necessarily care about that, but what I do want you to understand is the way that this jacks with contrast and brightness. So this is one of the reasons we're going to get into the lab today so we can see this, right? But you can imagine if we've got a steeper slope, what has happened to contrast? It's probably increased, right? A steeper slope would be an increased contrast. A flatter slope is going to be a lower contrast, right? It also, it changes the window width in essence, right? If we got that wider window width, we're going to have a long gray scale. If we have a narrower window width, we're going to have a short gray scale, right? So if you imagine that width level as being a slope from the bottom to the top, that's what we're talking about. Um, it can also start to change the uh, brightness, the overall brightness of the image as well. Um, uh, I think that, again, is just something that's easier to see. Okay, um, now one of the reasons I included this picture here is because it's kind of, we're, we're, we're moving now, we're transitioning from pre-processing to post-processing, right? So if we think about pre-processing being all those things the computer does automatically, right? Um, 
we can think about it as all those things that we do, you know, to, to put our faces on for the day, right? Post-processing is everything that goes on after the fact, right? So, I don't know what I just did. You know, this woman's at a dinner party, her, her lipstick's faded a little bit, she's gonna touch it up with using the butter knife, right? Um, or using a selfie picture or something like that. Um, this is the post-processing processing things. Not ideal. The butter knife's maybe not the best mirror, right? Um, but can we still touch up the picture a little bit? Yeah, we can. So um, one thing that we should understand is that um, this, in essence, is why digital systems have a greater dynamic range than film screen imaging. There is more information than meets the eye, right? So all these post-processing op operations allow us to access some of that additional information. Um, at the same time, though, the digital image, if we just looked at the raw data from the image, um, it would just look kind of uniformly gray because that's what it got, right? And it's just giving you what it's got. Um, what we would need, though, would need to have some amount of contrast to it. So it's got to artificially manipulate the image to give us contrast. So that's what we're talking about here. I know this is a busy slide. This is found on page 32 in our textbook. A lot of this information, though, we've already looked at in CT. Um, so the computer is going to go through processes with the histogram in order to draw contrast out, right? And it uses, to control that, it changes the steepness of what we will call an exposure gradient, right? Now, gradient is just a fancy word for some kind of shift in color, right? So I'm trying to see if there's an example of a gradient here in our textbook. Probably the best one is on the stitched image here. We see a shift in color. If we look at the edges of the image, we see a shift in color going from black. It shifts through gray. I'm looking past the collimated field into white, right? That shift from black to white is a gradient, right? So this is different from gradients used in MRI, right? Um, this, is, uh, this is a color gradient. Um, so it's going to change the degree of that color gradient. It can also change the brightness. It does that um, by changing the, the toe or the shoulder of the curve. So what it's going to draw on there is what's called an H and D curve. So as the computer draws these curves on there, it is manipulating um, the image contrast. These parameters should only be adjusted to enhance the image, right? That seems like a no-brainer, but um, one thing that you should be aware of is that um, no amount of contrast adjustment or brightness adjustment it can take the place of proper technical factor selection. So if we just didn't have the, tech, the right technique to begin with, no amount of manipulation is going to improve it because chances are there'll still be some quantum model there or perhaps total saturation of the image. We've talked a little bit about uh, spatial resolution already. Um, this textbook goes a little bit deeper with it and, and refers to it as spatial frequency resolution. Um, this has to do with the sharpness of the detail in the image. Um, and this is largely affected by uh, focal spot and OID. So you may remember one of the golden formulas that we introduced last year, right, is focal spot times OID divided by SOD gives you unsharpness or penumbra, right? So that's what this statement is saying. It's affected by your selection of focal spot size, what OID and what SOD was the image taken at, right? It does have bearing on the computer, right? So we can use the computer to decide what structures should be enhanced. We can control the degree of enhancement, right? Um, and we can apply different amounts of edge enhancement to the image, right? If you're totally lost on the focal spot size OID thing, I think I just recently put out a video where I just kind of worked problems related to it, right? Um, just on a worksheet. So I can uh, I can send that to you all via, via email. Can you say the formula again? <clears throat> all right, so we can overdo it with the edge enhancement is one of the big takeaways there. Um, 
anytime we do not use an appropriate uh, algorithm, right, it's going to throw off the uh, the image quality, right? There's some facilities that do not want rad text manipulating images before sending the packs. The reasons for that um, is it reduces the amount of manipulation that radiologists may be able to do, right? Um, so basically, after the image is stored to PACS, it loses some of that um, information from the original image, right? We can also think of other reasons why facilities would not want text post-processing. One example is your monitor is not as nice as the radiologist's monitor, right? Um, that's a really obvious one. So if you're doing manipulation on one monitor, but they've got a nicer monitor and, and some of the detail is lost, they're going to see that on their monitor, right? Another reason is, is if we're having to frequently manipulate images, again, something's wrong with our workflow. We're not doing something right. Edge enhancement is an example of that, right? Um, if we do edge enhancement too far, right, um, we're going to wind up having some reduction in information. In fact, if we over -ap apply edge enhancement, we can actually wind up obscuring something like a fracture, right? So the way edge enhancement works is it uh, takes the numbers of pixels are involved and then, then it averages them, right? So uh, if it averages them more, you get a smoother image. If, you, if it averages them uh, less, basically you're going to have an enhanced image. So uh, if you have fewer pixels in the neighborhood included in the average, you start to enhance that edge, that area in the neighborhood where the pixel difference exists, right? So the smaller the neighborhood, the greater the enhancement, right? The smaller the neighborhood, the greater the enhancement. Um, sometimes this is referred to as uh, kerneling as well, or um, a form of uh, filtering. Filtering is another term. So when we talk about CT using filtered back projection, it's not filtering in the sense of like filtering out x-rays, like what we're filtering we were talking about in terms of radiation safety, it's computer filtering, right? So I don't want you to be thrown off by that AKA. It may be edge enhancement, it may be kerneling, it may be computer filtering, right? Um, so what happens is frequencies of, in the area of interest that are known, they can be amplified, others might be suppressed, right? So here's the danger. You might have just suppressed the thing that was a fracture or the thing that was a fat pad sign on a lateral elbow, right? In enhancing the detail of the bone, you might have suppressed the fat pad sign. This is kind of an example of that edge enhancement in makeup, right? Same, similar process, right? We've done these contouring in order to enhance the edges between the cheekbones and the eyes, right? Or between the eyebrows and the forehead, right? Um, so we would call this a form of high pass filtering, right? It's an increase in contrast. Her face has less contrast in it in the upper left hand corner than it does on the right lower right hand corner. Clearly there's more contrast on her face. There's a sharp definition between um, her cheekbones and the cheek. Right? In the upper image, I do not see that same amount of definition. We can also suppress frequencies, right? And this is when, we're, when we do this, is called masking. And so she's also done that to her face as well, right? Um, so she, there's areas where she felt like there was a blemish or something like that. And so by applying this makeup, she was able to smooth out that blemish, right? Now the problem with that, we can do the same thing to our x-rays. We can smooth out these blemishes in the image. What happens as we smooth it out, though? What was I saying happens as we smooth it out? We're going to lose, like a fracture, we would lose something um, that might be diagnostically significant. So um, we can use this technique for enhancing uh, large structures such as organs and soft tissues that are noisy, right? Um, this masking technique. Uh, or this edge enhancement technique, um, it's helpful there for enhancing large structures like the kidneys or something like that. Smoothing is kind of the opposite, right? So we had edge enhancement and masking on one side. Smoothing is the total opposite, right? Um, so I think about it as being something like these, I don't know what you call these things. What are they called? Face mask, right? 
So in the in the case of a of a face mask, like it's going to completely cover up and hopefully I guess heal the skin or something like that, right? This is similar to low pass filtering. In low pass filtering, um, it averages the frequency of each pixel with the surrounding pixel to remove high frequency noise. So it's getting rid of the edges. It's getting rid of the edges, right? So it is uh, reducing the noise and the contrast. <laughs> So one thing to bear in mind, with edge enhancement, you're in increasing the contrast and the noise. With edge enhancement, you're increasing the contrast and the noise. With smoothing, you're reducing the contrast and the noise. That's why I say they're the complete opposite, right? Low, pa low uh, pass filtering is useful in looking at small structures, like fine bone tissue. Could you say that again with the edge enhancement, increasing contrast and... Yes, edge enhancement increases contrast at the same time that it increases noise. It increases contrast and increases noise. Smoothing is going to reduce contrast and reduce noise, right? Um, I actually have a great example of this. Uh, I'll try to send it out via email. It's a picture of one of my dogs, Honey Bun, that I just edge enhanced over and over and over again. But you can do just that. You can look up edge enhancement tools online and just edge enhance a picture of like your friends or something over and over and over again. And you're gonna to start to see that noise come out. The, the edges will be there more clearly. I chose Honey Bun because she's got this crazy hairy face, right? And you can see the edges of the hairs on her face really clearly, but you start to see noise as well. So I'll, I'll share that with y'all here in a little bit. I did, I did, yeah, it's my son named it, Honey Bun. All right, window level and window width. I'm now on page uh, 32 in the textbook again. So window level controls how light or how dark the image is. Sometimes I describe it as the amounts of whites or blacks on the image, right? That's the level, how light or how dark the image is. Window width controls the amount of grays. So the ratio of black to white or the contrast, we could call it. So window level, brightness, window width, contrast, right? You can manipulate that. You can move your mouse around over the picture and it will change that. Um, <clears throat> if you've taken a good picture on the appropriate histogram with the right lookup table and centered appropriately, you should not have to do this, right? You can leave it up to the radiologist for doing that. So I know that technologists frequently mess with contrast and stuff at the QC workstation. What I'm saying is don't do that, right? You, there's no need. If you're confident in your technique, you shouldn't have to do that. Um, shuttering, we see this more with the PSP systems. It does not, um, it happens differently with digital. But basically, if there's an unexposed border around the collimation edge um, and there's light, like white light coming off the image, I have an example here on the next slide. This is difficult for the radiologist to look at. It's difficult for anyone to look at. And the reason for that is because of veiling glare. That area of white luminance on the computer screen um, causes overstimulation of the eyes and it makes it more difficult to see what we're actually looking for, the grays on the picture. So we call this sometimes white light blindedness. And there's actually research out there right now, I was just listening to a thing about it yesterday, that this is impactful to things like breast cancer, for example, which you wouldn't normally think about. But the amount of screen time that we're spending and the amount that our bodies are exposed to computer screens and this light that comes off of the computer screen is doing something to the vitamin D in our skin, right? We don't fully understand it, but there is actually really good research out there that says you should spend some hours of your day in total darkness ideally at nighttime, right? Your body needs the darkness in moments of your life. You should not be sleeping with lights on or sleeping in front of a computer screen. Your body needs the total darkness at some point in order to appropriately process vitamin D. So similar things are happening with our eyes is the big takeaway here. The radiologists need the darkness in the dark room, right? So to do that, the computer um, applies these shutters, right? Um, so here's an example of, a, of an image that was taken on a, on a PSP system, a computer radiography system, and it cut off, it applied this black mask around the image, it identified the edge of the collimated field and blacked out everything that wasn't there. 
Oftentimes if we shoot the part on a funky angle like this with the CR system, it throws off the shuttering and you wind up with a white background. Um, and that veiling glare <clears throat> is a problem. Now, one thing to bear in mind, with the digital systems, we do not have quite the errors that we used to have with computed radiography. But this shuttering function um, and applying shuttering yourself should never be a substitute for poor collimation. So if you see text, they didn't care about collimating, but now we're cropping the image, don't do that. In fact, it's illegal. Like, I, I think I can say at this point in time, there's been enough lawsuits where they cropped the image and there was actually something there out in the area where they cropped and the radiologist missed it. And guess what? Guess who they come looking for next, right? Who did the cropping, right? And the computer holds all that information in it. So do not post-process crop the images. Do not apply shuttering yourself. If the computer shutters it, cool, whatever. Don't shutter it yourself, right? Collimate appropriately. It's outside of our scope of practice, right? It's the nice way to put it. So the computer can also jack with image orientation. We can as well. Be careful as you do it, right? Um, that you flip the images appropriately. And this is another reason why we should be using lead markers on our images, because we can flip this image to where it looks bass backwards, right? So be aware of that. Um, it is helpful if you look at the cassette, particularly with these CR systems, and make sure that it's appropriately labeled. I'm not as familiar with how the DR system works to flip it appropriately, um, but I assume it has some way of doing that. Um, what, what have y'all seen out in the clinical sites? How, does, how do the DR systems flip or rotate the images? Do they just know? No, they'll come out, they'll come out of that. Okay, image stitching, y'all probably seen this maybe with scoliosis series at the um, Campbell's or somewhere. Um, we can take multiple images, stitch them together using different algorithms. Every single stitching system is a little bit different. Um, but here's an example of, of just that process where uh, these three different exposures were taken. They combined them into a single image so that the uh, person can, we used to back in the day, have these massive cassettes with a single film inside of them or a single a set of uh, PSP phosphor plates you could stack into this cassette and just take one picture and like an extended SID. It was very labor intensive. So this was a huge um, time saver and space saver for us. Okay, one of the last things we'll talk about is image annotation. Um, this allows uh, we can set preset terms or manually input text onto the image. Um, generally, these are placed on the image as a bitmap image. Sometimes they don't transfer to packs. It just uses, it just depends on the system that you're using. Like I've seen, um, we used to label images on, at one facility and realized it did not transfer over to, I think it was Novarad that we were using. They weren't transferring over. They've probably fixed that since then, but just be aware of that too. If you're, if you're putting on any kind of imitation, annotation on your images regularly, make sure that's showing up somewhere in packs. But here's an example. We all kind of can remember the annotation, you know, dropping annotation on our um, machine over here in the Fuji lab. We can magnify the images and zoom in or zoom out on the image. There's basically two different ways this can be done. Um, one of them works something like a magnifying glass where basically it's uh, magnifying the entire image. Another function is to zoom in just on one part. Now this is happening within the spatial domain of processing. It's just changing, in essence, the computer matrix size to where it appears that we're zooming in. One of the final things we should consider is demographic uh, information. And this one, again, may seem like a total no-brainer, um, but you've probably worked at facilities that are not handling patient demographics appropriately, right? Um, like either you're having to manually enter patient information prior to doing an exam. Have y'all worked at a facility like that? Where you had to type in the patient's name and birth date prior to doing the exam, right? That means that there's not an HL7 connection between the front desk the HIS, the hospital information system, and the RIS, or between that computer. So you're not able to, they've already entered the patient's name and date of birth at the front desk, right? Probably two or three times. 
but for whatever reason, the HL7 is not communicating, right? Um, that information to your machine. It might be that the machine's out of date. It might be just uh, poor connectivity, not a good network at the hospital for whatever reason. And the reason we shouldn't be manually entering it, right, is because they've already checked it and double checked it and the patient signed. This is my name and date of birth at the front desk. They didn't sign that when I manually entered it at the computer. So there's a room for error, right? Um, another reason that we don't really use this information fully is because the DICOM file stores all this information with the image. Right? So the DICOM has all the, what we call this metadata that's attached to the picture. And that metadata includes a lot of information, right? Stuff that would be helpful to managing patient care in our departments. So um, we should be aware of how this information is being viewed. Is it appropriately being sent over to PACs? All those types of things. Um, like when I look at the PACS system, I see almost every single facility is entering information differently. And so it shows up differently in PACS. At one facility, it might have it listed under accession number. Another one, it's the MR number. Another one, it's the exam number, right? They're entering all this information in different places. Again, this might not seem like big of a deal, but it does impact the way that data is being managed, right? We could have this massive amount of data that could guide all sorts of patient care instead of what we have is just kind of a hodgepodge, right? But the obvious thing for us as technologists is if the information's improperly entered manually or in some way is tagged inappropriately to the image, it may be impossible to find that in PAX. Think about how huge PAX is. And if I send something off without it being appropriately labeled, it's gone, right, at that point. And chances are it's also misread. The radiologist has misread someone's information. Um, this is one of the reasons why we should be careful anytime that there is the manual send. So a lot, some facilities, they use something like an automatic send. The minute that you take the picture, you're okay that that was the picture you take and it just automatically sends it off. Other places, you actually have to manually send and select where you want it sent to. Like one facility I worked at, you had to send three times. You had to send once to the hospital packs, once to the reading radiologist packs, and then a third time to a referring physician. So there was all sorts of potential for stuff to be missent. And all the time, we would missend something to the wrong referring physician. That was the most common error that would happen. Not a big deal, right? But occasionally, you'd get those really snippy front desk people who would call you and say, why the hell did you send us this? And you'd have to explain it was an error. And they would think that you're an idiot, right? It wasn't fun. All right. So where would we run into errors with mislabeled or missent information? It is in a query, right? So within PAX, you have this archive query. It's a search function that allows you to look for images that were taken in the past. This is, again, a no-brainer. We do this all the time. All your final comps with me, I've had to do an archive query, find the day that you did the exam, look up the accession number, make sure that this was the actual exam that you did. We can also search it by other functions, right? We can search by pathology, anatomic region, um, exam number, all those things. So here's just a further example of those types of things. Um, a lot of times we can place multiple query fields in order to narrow down the search. All right, that's what I got for y'all. Thank y'all so much.